thank you very much, Paul, for your introduction. Uh, before I get down to my presentation, I just wanted to briefly mention that what I'm presenting today is part of my uh, larger research project, my dissertation, that focuses on the emergence and functioning of uh, volunteer networks in the frontline regions. And uh, there, uh, broadly speaking, I uh, look at the ways uh, civilians mobilize to address the traumatic realities of war in Donbass, and also how this uh, wartime engagement uh, has impacted their sense of national belonging, civic uh, responsibility, and uh, gender identities. Uh, so to collect data, uh, I um, conducted field work uh, in 2015. I wanted to put it out there just to uh, mention that there might be a temporal uh, dimension to my findings. Uh, and I interviewed about uh, 95 volunteers. I also did participant observation of their work. And uh, right now I want to talk about the uh, work of volunteers, but focus on less visible aspects of it. Because uh, we know a lot about uh, volunteers providing emergency assistance, procuring for the army. We discussed some of it yesterday. But I want to show that volunteers' work is not limited to that. And uh, a big part of what uh, volunteers do uh, has to do with ensuring the substantive citizenship of uh, combatants and war-affected civilians. Uh, OK, so um, a very brief uh, theoretical note here. What do I mean by substantive citizenship? Uh, in recent years, um, I mean last 10 to 15 years, scholars have problematized this understanding of citizenship as a purely juridical uh, term um, symbolized by the passport one possesses. Instead, uh, citizenship uh, has come to be understood as um, a full membership in the community where one lives, as full access to uh, public goods and services, and so the concept of substantive citizenship captures this difference uh, between legal rights confirmed, uh, conferred on individuals through state legislation and policies and the ability or inability to access and exercise these rights uh, in practice. Uh, and the um, inability to uh, exercise these rights in practice uh, can... Um, because by uh, different reasons, uh, it can, um, can be uh, precluded by bureaucrats, especially street-level bureaucrats, uh, those who have immediate contacts with citizens and are tasked with uh, delivering public uh, services and uh, goods. It, um, certain groups of individuals can also be excluded from um, uh, their rights based on different classification criteria, for example, based on their gender, ethnicity, or uh, social classification criteria like being an IDP or being cons conscripted in the military. So uh, what I'm going to talk about right now is the three areas um, uh, where there was this disjunction, disjuncture between legal rights of combatants and uh, IDPs and their lived experiences, uh, the inability to access these rights and how volunteers made rights uh, related interventions to address that. And the first area is um, uh, the recognition of legal status uh, of uh, uh, war veterans and uh, during my field work in 2015, it was a major preoccupation for uh, volunteers because at that time, the first two wa waves of demobilization happened with uh, about uh, 40,000 um, uh, combatants uh, discharged from military service, but uh, a lot of them had difficulties uh, getting their status recognized uh, as uh, war veterans. And there were different uh, reasons or barriers uh, that they faced. The first one is um, legal confusions. The mechanisms were, were not clear. For example, there was no unified system of documentation with uh, military commanders providing proofs of service uh, that were not accepted by state institutions responsible for recognition and so on. There was also professional negligence with military commanders failing to document the fact of military ser service or the time frame of uh, military service and that information was absolutely necessary to get the status um, uh, recognized. And uh, IDPs uh, 
faced a related uh, set of issues because the legislation at that time was not adapt to address world realities. So for example, uh, a volunteer, a lawyer from Kharkiv I interviewed, uh, explained that there was a procedure uh, for person identification that required you to bring three family members, three relatives, or people you shared housing with, or who lived in the same neighborhood to testify your ad identity. But because uh, some uh, towns have been destroyed by violence and people got dispersed, it was incredibly difficult to bring these people uh, to testify. And so uh, IDPs struggled to restore that docu uh, their documents. And uh, as a result, they were not able to access uh, uh, welfare payments and things like that. So here, volunteers made uh, interventions to address that. And the first uh, kind of intervention was um, enhancing the legal framework of uh, rights and entitlements. Uh, they um, lobbied to improve the legal framework and also uh, engaged with inter international institutions to put pressure on the parliament and ministries to uh, address these issues. But the most common way um, was the provision of information about due process uh, of status recognition. Many of my respondents uh, gave advice on step, steps to be followed, located lawyers uh, who could help IDPs or combatants free of charge. They also directly contacted uh, military commanders respons responsible for missing documentation. And these uh, seemingly small but very numerous uh, interventions were very important because they ensured that people knew about the mechanisms and could access and exercise their rights in practice. So the second area um, uh, where there was this disjuncture between legal rights and lived experiences had to do with illegal practices and sabotage in local bureaucracies. Uh, uh, so here, legally soldiers and war veterans are entitled to a set of uh, social rights, such as access to land for personal uh, use, reduced tariffs uh, and uh, utilities, subsidies for education, subsidized public trans transportation, and so on. But there, there were many barriers that precluded them from accessing and exercising these rights. Um, again, uh, unclarities uh, in uh, legislation um, where land slots, uh, it was unclear how land slots get allocated uh, to war uh, veterans, how to identify these land slots. That was one of the reasons. And then uh, corruption at the local level um, with uh, judges or local bureaucrats taking advantage of this legislation. So land slots would get into the, hand, the hands of these people instead of uh, war veterans. Um, another systemic violation was linked to military higher ups uh, abusing the rights of regular soldiers and take it, uh, taking advantage of uh, their superior position. Uh, cases uh, when soldiers didn't receive the uniforms and food and sometimes their salaries uh, uh, were appropriated, uh, were numerous, or sometimes when social payments to um, um, a widow with four children, uh, in, like this, this widow, instead of getting uh, six, uh, 100,000 hryvnias would only get 600 hryvnias and uh, the rest of the money would disappear. Uh, so uh, volunteers uh, uh, just uh, uh, I wanted to mention about the situation with IDPs that uh, again uh, bu local bureaucrats often uh, derailed uh, their access to welfare payments to elicit uh, um, uh, informal payments, and it was so pervasive that one of the uh, one of my respondent uh, respondents mentioned that even staff at morgue would uh, um, slow down the process, and it was an indirect way to elicit payments uh, from uh, IDPs. And here, uh, volunteers made uh, case by case interventions where they would um, try to deal with uh, individual cases. They also uh, put public pressure on bureaucrats and uh, go out and talk to local and national media outlets to make these cases known and in this way put pressure on, um, on local bureaucrats uh, 
to stop illegal practices and generally raise the awareness about the situation with uh, rights infringement. And the third area, I'll just briefly mention that, um, uh, was in the health uh, care system. Um, so here the problem was again the um, prevalence of informal uh, practices where a lot of IDPs and soldiers were asked to pay for services that they were supposed to get free of charge. Also bureaucratic inadequacies uh, where soldiers would have to um, prove the fact that they lost their leg on the front even though it was clear and uh, it uh, again uh, created these barriers for them to uh, get medication free of charge. Uh, IDPs were uh, asked to pay for services and these payments would be listed as charitable donations. Um, so volunteers again try to address these issues so on case uh, by case um, uh, basis. Uh, they also tried to talk about it, raise public awareness, but there was some, um, uh, they were very careful here because there was also this understanding that local bureaucracies, especially hospitals, were overloaded with this inflow of uh, people, sometimes non-residents of the city, and the local budgets were not adjusted. So these local bureaucracies could not uh, properly handle the situation. And in these instances, sometimes volunteers would fundraise to um, uh, provide medication for uh, combatants and uh, IDPs, and in, in this way, yeah, expand the capacity of local bureaucracies to to deal with the war realities. And uh, very briefly, I just wanted to mention implications of this rights-based intervention. So um, uh, I, uh, I consider this, uh, uh, these interventions as a collectivizing enterprise, something that de-individualizes in de the cost of war so that the burden is uh, more equally shared um, among uh, the community of, uh, at large, not just the people who are uh, most affected by the war. Uh, also, uh, uh, this kind of engagement uh, builds uh, connections and solidarities uh, around war experiences. And to be able to conduct this engagement, uh, volunteers also construct uh, discourses to explain it, uh, about discourses about the worsiness of these uh, groups of uh, uh, population, about their precariousness. And in this way, they integrate these groups into uh, society at large and in a way expand the space of belonging for them. And uh, one last thing I wanted to mention that uh, one important implication is that these interventions also expand the capacity of local bureaucracies in a way. And uh, we can see that volunteer, even though welfare uh, provision is the function of the state, but here welfare gets structured from below, uh, with volunteers enable bureaucrats to conduct their ser services in a proper way. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.